Good evening. We'd like to welcome everybody to the Thursday, March 16, 2017 meeting of the Enlarged City School District of Middletown Board of Education. At this time, if you could please rise for our Pledge of Allegiance. Um, Mr. Perino, if you can do the honors. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you can remain standing, please, for a moment of silence. Thank you, President Estrada. Uh, this moment of silence is for Z Rosario Mealy II. Rosario served in our custodial and buildings and ground staff for many, many years. A very well-respected individual, very hard worker. You asked Rosario to do anything, he never refused. The, the entire family has been associated with the district. Uh, Rosario III, Roy, is also on the custodial staff. Roy's mom, Helena, now deceased, uh, she was on the, uh, also worked in food service and also uh, then worked for uh, Mr. Scott and the buildings and ground staff. Uh, if I may please, uh, he was a dedicated husband and devoted father who had great sense of humor and was a fantastic storyteller. He always sacrificed for the good of his family, and he was a good provider for them throughout his life. He loved his cars and was an active member of the Tri-State Auto Club. He was also involved in the community, uh, active in St. Joseph's Church. So please remember Rosario Mealy II and your thoughts and prayers. He definitely will be missed. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perino. And now for the mission statement for the Enlarged City School District of Middletown, Mr. Crescenzo. We strive to provide fiscally sound education opportunities in a safe environment that continuously supports our diverse student population. We will enable all students to graduate, to reach their full potential, to become lifelong learners, and to be competitive, productive, productive members of society. Thank you, Mr. Crescenzo. Roll call, Ms. Clark. Here. Here. Mr. McElroy. Mr. Perino. Here. Mr. Pierre. Ms. Biasen. Here. Pastor Williams. Here. And I'd like to make an addition to this evening's agenda before we do a formal approval of the agenda. Under 11 action items, we'd like to add letter E, a resolution for an Article 78. And I'll need a motion for approval of tonight's agenda as amended. So, Moved second. by Pastor Williams, seconded by Mrs. Knapp. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. I need approval of the regular minutes for March 2nd, 2017. No Moved by Pastor Williams, seconded by Mrs. Knapp. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. We move on to our recognitions, our announcements, and community reports. And first up, with a very special recognition for our friends over at ShopRite, Mr. Perino. Thank you very much. Uh, pleased to have with us tonight uh, Mr. Robert Courtney and Mr. Uh, Ms. Romina Velarde from ShopRite. Uh, would you like to come on up to the mic and discuss a couple things here? Ed, do you want to come up? Sure. have a hard time getting Romina to come up for, <laughs> for photos with the breakfast of champions. <laughs> but this, uh, both uh, uh, Robert and Romina are from ShopRite on 2-11. Uh, the latest thing that has happened is that uh, ShopRite 2 sponsored and has sponsored the breakfast of champions and the breakfast of champions is in the high school and Dwayne Whitaker, house principal, originated this. And students are nominated who show character, integrity, and go about their business in a workmanlike manner. 
And believe me, uh, ShopRite 211 puts on a great breakfast for, uh, for the kids. But, you know, that's not all that ShopRite 211 has done. Uh, they are very active in the uh, MHS Athlete of the Month. Yep. As a matter of fact, uh, it, it's ac the correct term is the ShopRite MHS Athlete of the Month program, and they play a part in nominating the athlete and uh, invited then to ShopRite, and name goes on a plaque, which if you're down to ShopRite, uh, you can take a look at that. And also, uh, in many cases, a number of our athletes uh, are uh, pictured on the bulletin board also. Uh, ShopRite also is a contributor to the No Kid Hungry program. Now, that is technically a Lions Kid uh, Lions program, Lions Club program. However, uh, Glenis Fogley coordinates that, but it impacts all our students, the students of the Middletown District. So, uh, a excellent job there. Uh, ShopRite, had, uh, when we opened the Fowler Field, uh, you sponsored the fireworks, and you're always there when there's a special event handing out uh, items. So, you're really partners in education and believe me parents take notice of this and I am sure and parents have told me that they do a, a, much of the shopping at, at your store because you you reciprocate with the students in our district so I want to thank both of you we all this is President thank Estrada the Superintendent Eastwood thank you thank you take a little photo here and hand out Thanks. some certificates. Ed, you want to take a picture? Sure. Picture? Yeah, we'll get yeah, sure. one yeah. One up here. We're going to have to. And I also do want to thank them because they hire a lot of our kids, um, as well as parents of our kids through our, our community. My son being one, I just uh, told them, and he, he loves it. I remember when he got his first job over at ShopRite, I, I cried in the parking lot for about 20 minutes before I finally <laughs> let him go on his own. But uh, thank you for your You're continued support job, of our probably. district. Uh, we'll continue on with our recognitions, announcements, and community reports. Uh, we'll start off with Mr. Pierre. Do you have anything this evening? Uh, just a couple of things. I'd just like to congratulate the uh, students uh, who uh, participated in the Odyssey of the Mind competition and a special recognition for Monhagen Middle School for their uh, achievement in that uh, competition. Also, I went to the uh, Sojourner Truth Awards uh, this past Friday. I'd just like to congratulate all the students who received an award. Uh, at that event, and my son Christian Pierre also received an award. Where did his, you sat out on the stand? I was in the back. I, you should have sat with us down below. I wanted to sit with the family, so I, I stayed with them there. Uh, but uh, it was a great event. I really enjoyed it. That's it. Absolutely, we had a very good following yeah. there. Yes. This is not. Um, I just want to say thank you to. Um, all the staff and, and everybody who's been in integral in the part of cleaning up and getting us through the snowstorm. I know it sounds kind of weird, but uh, as somebody who has to go to work, but I didn't have to, it really is appreciative. Everybody comes out and does extra things to help out. So I appreciate that very much, and I want to thank everybody. Thank you, Mrs. Knapp. Mr. Tobias. Thank you, Mr. Estrada. Um, I also want to comment on Odyssey of the Mind. And um, if I remember correctly, when I first got on this board, Mr. Del Morrow, we did not have Odyssey of the Mind, did Correct. we? 
and um, it was an issue that was brought to the table. So thank you for having it. Who brought uh, it to the table? <laughs> uh, I guess this Be proud. Thank you for that. I guess um, what I really want to say is that unless you get really actively involved, and I'm sure it goes with even the sports program, you don't realize the amount of time that the coaches, the students, and the parents have to dedicate to a program. I know personally here that the coaches were here until 6 o'clock at night for two and three weeks before and prior to that it was 5 o'clock at night. Um, presidential, uh, Maple Hill, uh, Carter, uh, kudos for their efforts. I think it was one of the most wonderful experiences that all of the students, there are only seven students out of each of the buildings that can be on a team. And to Monhagen, where they came from in how many years to get first place, and they're competing with school districts in this region and some from the other side of the, of the river, and those buildings have been competing for many, many, many years. And that was one of my comments as I kept saying to them, you know, you're going to come across some stiff, stiff competition. We have a lot to be proud of with those teams. Um, the next thing, and Linda mentioned about the, the storm, but I want to um, call out the um, NJROTC. Um, I live over in Clemson Park in the condominiums, and um, we had a problem um, trying to get our folks out. And one of our neighbors called somebody, and members of the NJR. OTC came to help shovel us out and shovel some of the elderly neighbors. Uh, one woman is in her 90s. And the students were offered $20. Um, and I don't know how many $20. I don't know if it was one I didn't get involved. They didn't want to take it. And when they did accept it, they told them that it was going to go for their tricky tray. So they did not personally profit from the time that they devoted and they were there for a couple of hours. And the last um, announcement that I have, and it, it's kind of with a heavy heart that I mentioned this, um, we have a student, as many of you know, Andrew Stevens, who has been fighting cancer. He had a bone marrow transplant last summer. He went in for an MRI scan two weeks ago um, tomorrow, and um, he was diagnosed that the cancer is back. Andrew is a student um, at Twin Towers, and presently, he is back in Maria Ferrari uh, Children's Hospital in Westchester. So I know that our entire staff and everyone is um, behind Andrew in this fight um, to beat cancer. And so I ask um, everyone for their thoughts and prayers to the family. this one? Yeah. Okay. Because I'm short. <laughs> I went, I'm Wendy Manis. I'm the nurse at Twin Towers. Nothing I'm telling you is confidential. His mom puts everything on Facebook. Andrew is an amazing kid. I went to see him on Saturday. On Friday, he had had, um, they had tried to go in. The cancer right now is in lymph nodes in both the right side and in the left side of his pelvis. And they tried to go into the left side because that was the more impacted side to remove what they could. And unfortunately, they couldn't remove any of it because there's too many major blood vessels involved. I figured he's going to be knocked out on Saturday from all the anesthesia, just from the news. He's very involved in his treatment. He knows everything. That kid, you can't hold him down. And... Um, Mom has my cell number. She texts me all the time. And last night, he FaceTimed me at 9.30 at night. And I'm like, what are you doing? Because he, he had had a procedure done in the morning. I'm like, why aren't you sleeping? He's like, no, nah, I'm playing. He's an amazing kid. Um, he'll be going through a clinical trial. You know, knock wood, hopefully everything works. Um, he did have Stelsem stem cell transplant back um, two months before school started and it was amazing that he was able, everybody was amazed that he was able to come back to school in September. 
The thing about the cancer he has, it's very sneaky and very aggressive. And two and a half months ago at his last scan, he was cancer free. So they are attacking it and just keep them like Mrs. Tobiasen said, just keep them in your thoughts and prayers. This is one kid, you know, who after he found out his diagnosis this time around, looked at his mother and said, I beat it before and it was in more places. I could do it again. It's only in two. So he's got the great outlook for it and we're all pulling for him and all he wants to do I mean the people from ShopRite left already but they work with him just to give back to Maria Ferrari so he's a great kid I'm sorry to interrupt you no, for that's that okay. thank you Mrs. Mavs thank sorry. you Mr. Bison you want to add or you good sorry. I'm finished okay thank you very much you're welcome Pastor Williams uh congratulations first of all we've, um, we've uh, my other uh the board members have already mentioned the Odyssey of the Mind. Uh, congratulations to uh, their accomplishments. I, I, I believe that we are, are blessed with some wonderfully intelligent um, young people in this district. And um, intelligence, from my perspective, is really capacity. And uh, so I want to congratulate not just the, the, uh, the students that participated uh, in every area there, but uh, also to the coaches. Uh, who are who are helping to fill the capacity of intelligence that these children have, and uh, it takes special people to be able to uh, coach coach and and to stimulate that muscle because <laughs> it is it is it is muscle. Sometimes we look at athletics as uh, you know in, in one perspective, but this is uh, just as if not more important. So congratulations to them. Uh, congratulations once again to. Uh, the students at Twin Towers attended the, the, uh, their concert on last week. Uh, as always, they performed wonderfully. Uh, and what's exciting for me in watching now, because I have an eighth grader who just left here, who's been involved in the music department at Twin Towers from sixth grade all the way up to eighth grade, and he's coming to the end of his middle school uh, time, and he's going to be moving on to the high school. But to have watched uh, those children progress and improve from year to year is amazing, especially to uh, somebody like myself who is also a musician, uh, just to watch them progress and to improve. And uh, there's, there's, no, there's no limit to what they'll be able to do in that area. And so I want to congratulate uh, the staff there and all the students that participated uh, in that concert. And, and lastly, I also had the privilege of attending the Sojourner Truth Awards at the uh, at Orange County Community College. Uh, I go every year and uh, had had the privilege in past years of, of serving uh, with the, with the uh, college, uh, providing, providing invocation and other things of that nature. Um, it was a wonderful event. Uh, I know so many students around the county and I watch students that I've known uh, from the day that they were born from several different school districts come up and receive their awards. So I was able to celebrate with all of them. But to see the sheer numbers of Middletown students that, <laughs> that were recognized on that night, Middletown had more than anybody, as we do every year. And so, um, again, it's a, it's a great testament, testimony to, uh, to the effort and the work that's put forth, not just from our students, but from our staff. Uh, we, have, we, we have an excellent school district, and uh, sometimes, sometimes I, I wonder uh, in my search, search for a new home where, where I will end up, uh, but I, I know this, that uh, I'm not gonna move anywhere outside of Middletown unless I'm moving to Barbados to get away from this snow. But uh, outside of that, outside of that, uh, I'm, gonna, I, I'm so excited. I said this years ago, and I'm, I'm, I'm about done, but I'm, I said this some years ago, that when I was younger, uh, in my, in, you know, some 30 years ago, I had said because of my experiences that I would never raise my children. And I, I hope everyone understands what I'm saying. I would never raise my children in Middletown School District. And I said that 30, maybe 35 years ago. Um, and I'm so glad that, um, that that has been turned around and that has been changed. I could not imagine raising my children uh, in another school district where they have more opportunities, where they, where they uh, are recognized, and, and I am excited. And so I want to thank our entire staff, our administration, um, 
whatever position, whatever place you play in this district, um, I congratulate you and thank you um, from the bottom of my heart. So that's all. Mr. Crescenzo. Thank you. Um, I accompanied Mr. Perino to the Breakfast of Champions, and I know he's going to want to talk more about this, but just um, a highlight, that was my first time there, and I was just so impressed. Was about 50 students received uh, the awards, and there were numerous different categories, such as character, um, uh, what they, their, their role in the school building, and uh, friendship and what have you, and, and academics. But the thing that moved me the most, their families were there, many, many of the families were there, and when their names were called, the smiles on their faces and the parents, you know, the clapping loudly, it was just a tremendous recognition program. And uh, it just left their feeling very, very good. And ShopRite supplied the breakfast and it was really outstanding. And then last week, <coughs> excuse me, I went to Maple Hill for their concert, <coughs> excuse me, and it was uh, zooming into space and the entire second grade participated in this, and this, the number of students had jobs to do around this uh, the concert. Uh, for example, they had uh, stars, lights of stars around the walls, and they were changing it, um, and they had a little news desk. But half the students were dressed as astronauts. They had little paper hats, and then others were space aliens. And they sang a number of songs, and one of them, they were singing what wound up to be, my very educated mother just served us nine pizzas. That's the nine planets, and they named each planet, blah, 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 and they got to Pluto, and I'll say, ooh, you know, how did they miss that, that Pluto's not a, considered a planet anymore? Well, one of the students at the news desk made an announcement that Pluto is no longer a planet. Then he went off into what I thought was probably the best part of the entire uh, uh, concert. Uh, they sang a song that said, uh, Pluto, keep your chin up, call me whatever you want, and I'll keep moving around the sun. So they gave this message that nobody, no matter how different you are or whatever you, know, you feel about yourself, what people feel about you, keep your chin up, you're a good person, you're an entity, uh, you're very, very important. And it just came over so well. And every student participated, they were laughing and singing and dancing and everything. And um, Amy, I'd like to recognize the uh, staff, uh, Amy Creedon, obviously, the, the principal of Twin Towers, the entire um, second grade, all the teachers, Andrew Proust, uh, Jesus Morales, Janine Gessler, uh, Rebecca Tomasulo, uh, Prasur McVeigh, Gina uh, Gautaramas, Megan Rabinowitz, Ruth Ann Galvin, and Jennifer Boston, and the music department, Antoinette De Pasquale and Jennifer Wentworth. It was really well done, and I left there with a big smile on my face. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cresenzo. Mr. Perino. Thank you, President Estrada. I just want to echo uh, Firstly, what Mrs. Knapp said, you know, our custodial and buildings and ground staff on these uh, inclement weather days, uh, they get uh, to their buildings and into the trucks and plowing uh, sometimes uh, before 5 o'clock in the morning while, you know, the majority of staff is home, was home for the uh, two days. So, again, uh, as Mrs. Knapp said, they do a yeoman's task. We have a, just a, a great bunch of uh, men and women in the custodial and buildings and ground staff. So again, thank you for uh, clearing, the, uh, clearing the snow from the uh, buildings and the grounds. Um, some nice events are coming up on the horizon. Uh, Tuesday, March 28th, the Pass and Review Ceremony at MHS. That's the uh, NJROTC Ceremony. And that ceremony is the cadets are reviewed by a, a, a commander outside the district, and it happens to be Commander Miller this time, retired commander. And he determines from observing the cadets if they are to be awarded the distinguished service uh, status, a unit, distinguished unit status. Now, you might say, well, what does that mean? Well, if, if we're awarded the distinguished unit status, we can then nominate uh, individual cadets for our service academies. And it also carries a great deal of weight when we are recommending cadets for NROTC scholarships. Uh, one of our cadets this year is graduating 
uh, from college, from Rutgers, uh, Jessica Glickman, as an officer in the U.S. Navy uh, after receiving one of these scholarships, which can mean as much as $150,000, $200,000, by the way. So it's Tuesday, March 28th, 1130 at, at the MHS in the uh, small gym. So you, the public is invited to attend as long with family and friends. So hope, we hope for the best, and I'm sure we'll receive that unit designation. A couple of other items coming up. A reminder, the musical Grease will be presented at MHS on Friday, March 31st, and Saturday, April 1st. Uh, there's one show on Friday, a 7 p.m. show, and on Saturday there are two. There's one at 2 o'clock and one at 7 p.m. $10 for adults and $7 for students. Seniors with a senior card are admitted free. Now, the uh, cast and crew under the leadership of Jim Schofield and musical director Bob Gavin they're going to preview this on March 23rd, this coming Thursday, at the Senior Center on Mulberry Street. And that'll be at 1 o'clock, and the public is invited to that. And just a shout-out to Dan Higby, because Dan is donating the bus for that trip uh, for that period of time. So thanks, Mid-City Mid Transit and Dan Higby. Um, Middletown Elks, large. 1097 were scheduled to be here this evening to present certificates uh, for students who work the February 5th pancake breakfast. However, the Elks Lodge, they're going to do something this year a little special. They have invited all students who work throughout the years, uh, throughout this year on events, to a ZD and meatball dinner at the Lodge on March 28th at uh, it's going to be at 5.30, and parents are also invited, which I, I thought was very nice. Uh, we expect the following there, the, uh, the MHS and JROTC, Munhagen Junior Honor Society, Carter Elementary Honor Society, Maple Hill Elementary Honor Society, and Presidential Park Elementary Honor Society. So... Um, Looking forward to that dinner, and if any board members or administration wants to stop by, I'm sure everybody will be welcome. I um, have to give a shout-out to uh, all the students. Uh, Vince talked about it, the uh, Breakfast of Champions. We mentioned it at the mic. It's always a very uplifting event to see these students who go about their job in a very workmanlike manner, nominated by staff members. Uh, receive recognition certificates and uh, awards, and we the, we talked about the role of Shoprite in uh, in this and Dwayne Whitaker, um, uh, Pastor Williams, Bishop Williams, and Mr. Senzo talked about music in our schools month this month. Uh, great uh, concert at Monhagen Middle School and Twin Towers. Interestingly enough, at Monhagen. The, our new uh, library media specialist up there, Emily Soper, she ran a book fair about an hour before the, uh, the concert, which is good because parents arrive early with the students and sometimes they're looking for something to uh, do. Twin Towers concert, as uh, Pat Bishop Williams mentioned, was also great. And finally, this is not only uh, music in our schools month. It's also Women's History Month. And I asked uh, 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 Mo to flash a collage that was done at Manhagen uh, Media Center. Pardon me, Mo's? At Manhagen Media Center uh, on women's history. The, the students and the Library staff and library aides worked on this, and they also, there's a display of biographies in the building also. In addition, it's on the screen, John. it is on the screen, okay. That's, that's great, great work 
thanks Mo for putting that up. Women, I, March is Women's History Month. Who runs the world? Rose, who runs the world? What's we that do, say? John. There you we go. Do. I knew Remember you were going to. Every successful man has a world. I know you were going to say that. But also, at not to be outdone, also in Twin Towers, Karen Cecil, who is the library media coordinator, uh, in conjunction with the Builders Club, um, also put up a number of bulletin boards and, and edited some biographies. And just talking about the Twin Builders Club, they were at the uh, Kiwanis Pancake Breakfast this past uh, Saturday. And really, the Kiwanis Club is also one of our partners in education. We have the MJROTC, the Key Club working, and the Builders Club from Twin Towers. So it was a great day, and I heard nothing but not good comments about MHS, the facility at MHS. As a matter of fact, one staff member from another district photographed our cafeteria because she wanted to take that back to her home district. And a number of people commented on the accommodations. And one of the st our staff members, Darcy, always does a great job facilitating the event with the Kiwanian. So uh, good job. To all on that, and I think I'm done, Mr. Shada. Thank you. For Thank you, Mr. The Perino. Time. No problem. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Bison, you had one other item. Yeah, I forgot. When we came in um, earlier this evening, I heard the bagpipes across the mm. hall. I guess practicing, and I really thought maybe we would be serenaded. I assume <laughs> they're going to be in New York tomorrow for the St. Patrick's Day parade. I think one of Pastor Williams, uh, your son, is plays a bagpipe, doesn't he? Which is not the easy. It doesn't sound. Which, which is uh -oh. not the I'm not going to ask how he plays the play. bagpipes because I didn't like that response over there. Come on, Dad, you got to be a little more supportive over there. Are they going to the city tomorrow? Oh, they're not. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. It was kind of difficult to speak. Right. Disappointed because they were here last year and they were very good. We'll get them out. And that's another. How long? Two years? Is this their second year or third year? I think third. third, right? third. Yeah. Great things here in Middletown. Most of these kids that are in bagpipes now, uh, they, they took the commitment during the, the uh, music camp this past summer. And, uh, and they, performed, they performed on their cantors. Which is which is just the, the flute part of it, I guess, uh, and uh, they performed. And they, my son received his bags about two weeks ago. So, um, uh, as much as it's been a challenge, I'm I'm proud of him. So, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. been a challenge for me. It's got to start somewhere, you know. But it's got to start somewhere. So, between that and the violin, I'm doing great. I, I want to just mention. That some people may say, "Well, why do you have a bagpiping?" group here and the whole idea of the bagpipers is the same as why do we have a steel drum core here it's to represent and respect all the indifferences that are inside our community um, of course Caribbean steel band that speaks for itself because we we do have a lot of folks from the Caribbean but the bagpiping really is um, out of respect for all of the first responders that we have in this district and as most people that know first responders, they're very much into uh, bagpiping and marching and parades and those kinds of things. Um, so it, it is a way to show respect for a different group of individuals inside um, our community because we do, in fact, have an enormous number of first responders uh, inside our district. So that's the, that's the reason why. Um, and I will complete our recognitions announcements. Uh, again, congratulations to the Odyssey of the Mind folks at every, every building. We will be having a recognition for all of those teams, um, but we've scheduled it for the second meeting in April since the Monhagen group has to go to the states in uh, early Binghamton. April, or Binghamton yeah. early April. So we want to make sure they're concentrating on their next endeavor. Um, thanks again to those from Buildings and Grounds who were able to show 
and help us out with uh, getting ready. Um, it's been a while since our staff had to endure a snowfall all at once of that magnitude. Um, I also want to thank the uh, DPW folks from both the city of Middletown and the town of Wallkill um, for doing their uh, darndest to make sure that we have um, our roads cleared for all of our staff and our uh, students and our buses. Um, I know it was a challenging evening. I know uh, town of Wallkill actually had to remove the plows because the weather got so bad on Tuesday. Um, with that in mind, um, a couple of things. If we can have our residents, please make sure to clear your sidewalks. Um, when the sidewalks are not clear, the students, our walkers, which are mostly elementary schools, a lot of elementary school kids, then have to go out on the road. And unfortunately, because of the amount of snow that we have, um, the amount that's extended out into the road is even more. So it is creating a very dangerous situation. Um, one thing, and maybe Mr. Scott can help me, um, do we know the owners, and I, I'm not trying to put people on the spot here, who own this, who would technically be the owners of the sidewalks that are across the street of Wisner from Twin Towers. It's right behind the development that sinks below mm -hmm. because literally the sidewalks are not accessible at all on the other side of Twin for literally, I want to say, 75, 100 yards. Am I right, Mr. Dean? Probably. I do believe it's probably that um, apartment complex the goes development through below. the block. I, I think so. Is there any way that we can get word out? I mean, they may not be aware of it, mm -hmm. um, but that is a very dangerous area and a sidewalk that's used not only by the Twin Towers folks, but the high school students when they're leaving. I, I think that uh, the most appropriate thing to do would be to call the city because the yes. mayor has issued a proclamation. Mm -hmm. um, Within or, a certain period of time, I think. Well, right? until Saturday. Okay. And as part of that proclamation, uh, basically has said that if necessary, they would hire um, our subcontract to get those cleaned, and I mm -hmm. assume and that that would be back charged back to them. Yeah, I, don't yeah, know I, I can that. Uh, discuss that with Mr. Tuwil. That'd be great. See if we can get that's that. a major one. <laughs> Take care of. Um, that affects both the high school mm -hmm. and Twin Towers, and I know we have a lot of walkers there. I mean, they do have access to the sidewalk on the other side, but then that creates people crossing the street at probably one of our busiest intersections because of the 211 light sure. um, mm -hmm. and stuff. That would be great. Thank you. Yep. Um, also, congratulations to all of our Sojourner Truth Awards. When I first came onto the school board, I think we had 30 awardees, 20 or 30 awardees, and now we're probably the top school district in the county as far as awards concerned. Mr. Perino just reminded me it was 127 students on uh, Friday, so great job to all of them. Um, my apologies that we had to cancel a school concert on Friday because of the weather but we were able to at least uh, enjoy the Sojourner Truth Awards because a lot of our kids um, could not go to the award ceremony because of the concert, but since the concert was called off, they were able to go to get their awards. So um, they do a nice job over at the college um, acknowledging all of our students um, as well as the other ones from throughout the district. Um, and that, I think, concludes our, um, our recognitions, announcements, and community reports. Next up is our first opportunity to address the school board. We will have a second opportunity to address later in the evening that will be specific to the budget. We have that one later on because we want to make sure you get an overview of the budget before uh, we make comment, allow for public input. So at this time, if you have any other comments that you'd like to address to the school board at this time, you have four minutes. There's a sign-up sheet over at the podium. It's our opportunity to listen to the community. We do not dialogue with the folks who will be speaking to us. If you do have a question that administration can answer on the spot, they'll try to answer that for you. Otherwise, we'll table it and try to get research it and get the, the right answer for you at our next school board meeting. So would anybody like to address the board at this time? Uh, no, we don't have any takers. Uh, Ms. Clark, any letters? No letters? We'll move on to personal action items. We have several uh, personal action items. I would like to do 19A separate. Does anybody have any issue with doing 19C through E? I'm sorry, 19B through E together? No. Okay. 
So first off, I need a motion for approval of pers personnel memorandum 19A administrative. So moved. Moved by Mr. Perino, seconded by Pastor Williams. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Before, um, I need a motion to approve personnel memorandum 19B through 19E. So moved. Moved by Ms. Tobias and seconded by Pastor Williams. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. With the passage of uh, personnel memorandum 19A, we have um, a recognition um, for a new employee. But we'd also, before we get to that, like to acknowledge the retirement of um, John, Kosky. John Kosky from our technology, mm -hmm. de technology department, um, effective October 27th, later on in the next school year, or earlier on in the next school year. So congratulations and thank you for your service, Mr. Kosky. And I'll hand, it, vote to know, right? and I, yes, <laughs> and I hand it over to uh, Mr. Tuttle for our other employee. Hi. Uh, good evening, uh, President. Estrada, members of the board, Dr. Eastwood, Mr. Del Moro. Um, tonight, uh, we'd like to introduce the newest administrative uh, member to our team, uh, Zig Nowicki. Come on up, Zig. Uh, Zig is actually um, he's going to be our director of personnel, um, some, a position that um, needs a lot of attention. And after our reorganization with technology and the administration department, uh, this is something that is um, definitely needed. Um, Mr. Nowicki comes to us uh, from Orange Ulster BOCES. He's been actually in the district for three years now, um, working as a, uh, what do they call it, consultant? Shared services. Shared services, yeah. So he's very familiar with our district. He's very familiar with our policies, our contracts, um, and he's a, really a pleasure to work with. Uh, brings a lot of experience, over 17 years' experience in the HR field. Um, so tonight I'd like to introduce Mr. Nowicki. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I hope great things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nowak. Um, at this time, it's our favorite subject, budget time, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Eastwood with the uh, budget overview recap, and that'll be followed by our second opportunity to address, which will be our first opportunity for public input on the budget. Um, thank you, Mr. Estrada. Um, as we know, uh, last Board of Education meeting, we did make some finish up our proposals on the budget. Uh, we also um, uh, gave you some information regarding our tax cap numbers and our gap that's in the budget. And uh, at this meeting, we I uh, wanted to at least make some corrections. Um, I'll let Mike um, go through those because they are very important corrections uh, based on our reassessment and uh, revisiting, if you will, uh, some of the calculations and numbers. Mike? Good. Thank you, Dr. Eastwood. Uh, President Estrada, members of the board, uh, as Dr. Eastwood said, um, tonight I think is our fifth meeting, um, and this is our public input meeting where we just really summarize all of the past presentations um, and and give the, uh, the public an opportunity to come up and uh, have some input on the budget process. Um, so for for tonight, what we're really focusing on is our recap. Um, essentially, we've gone through the administrative program, um, the program uh, component, the capital component, the benefits component. Uh, I have smart bond on there, but that was something we had in the past two years that is no longer on there as part of our budget. Um, so we have a proposed budget of 183 million nine hundred fifty-two thousand five hundred eighty-eight. Um, that would be a six six point oh four percent increase from last year's budget. Um, that's what we have been presenting, um, as what Dr. Eastwood was referring to. Um, we talked about the tax cap calculation, the eight eight steps. Um, at the last meeting, I, I misrepresented some information. I apologize for that. Um, I overstated uh, what our tax cap would be. Uh, after doing some recalculations, um, our tax cap is actually 3.919% over last year's levy, and our tax levy increase can be maximum at $2,829,561. Okay, so the difference for that is um, we had um, we were able to our tax levy was doubled that last at the last presentation, uh, which allowed for our shortage to be less. 
this reverses that and our taxes to the public is less and our shortage is greater. So we're going to show you that. Again, I apologize for that. Uh, this information has been looked over several times for accuracy. Um, basically, we take last year's information, um, plug it in, and there's a formula that the state gives us based on uh, pilots, last year's levy, uh, what we're going to put to our capital uh, debt service, and things like that. And then they get put in there the tax base growth factor and the, um, the, other, the uh, capital uh, tax levy factor as well. Um, so as far as the tax cap overview, uh, for 50% 50, 50 plus one vote, um, the budget increase from last year is 3.919% with a tax levy increase of 2,829,561. And so our total levy is $75,037,776. That's a lot of numbers to say. I apologize. Um, so that's the maximum we can go for 50 plus one without going over the cap. As we know, going over the cap requires a 60% plus one vote, and we really have no intention of looking at that as a solution for us. Um, so our proposed budget overview, our expenditures, as we stated before, is 183,952,588 number, and our revenues um, a little bit short of that, with a budget shortage of 6,300,819. Um, so in the previous meeting, I stated it was about half of that, and I do apologize again. Um, so this is where our numbers are, um, looking at the shortage. Um, some of the things that we still are under review is our health benefits plan. Um, looking at the state budget, which is due April 1st, they've had some um, preliminary runs at that this week. And then we're also looking for extra state aid. Uh, if we remember last year, we are in a very similar situation with a shortage uh, after the state budget was passed. Uh, we were able to come up with some more state aid funding. So we're kind of uh, really optimistic based on a couple of these things that are still in play, the health benefits and looking for some more state aid as well. Yeah, I just want to say, too, that when you look at that six number, um, you can actually trace that back to two issues. Uh, the first issue is the large increase in health care benefits that are being proposed by the consortium that we belong to at this period of time of $3.6 million in that range, just for the increase. And um, as we stated at the last Board of Education meeting, uh, this Board of Education acted about a month and a half or so ago, and um, we uh, and, uh, brought the services of a nationally recognized health care expert to come in and look at our situation uh, look at our um, employee experiences and then um, make recommendations and um, proposals to the Board of Education. We're in the middle of that process right now. We're hoping that um, that um, uh, consultant will be able to report out to the Board of Education and the committee that we have uh, within a two to three week period of recommendations. But we also feel fairly um, good about um, those recommendations and what they could do to mitigate uh, that number that you had seen up there pretty substantially. The second comes from issues that we've had a lot of conversation with over the last many years, and that, that is programmatic unfunded mandates. And I'm not going to go into the detail of those, but the long and short of it is uh, one of those uh, mandates, which is Part 154 uh, alone, uh, you've heard me have comments about that because of the size of the increase in services uh, without really, in true, in true ways, passing uh, funds to the school districts um, that are most um, impacted by that regulation. To us, those uh, costs uh, originally thought to be um, in the $800,000 range uh, have now over the last two years climbed to uh, almost uh, between four and a half and five and a half million dollars and are expected to grow uh, even more so. You take those two pieces right there, the health care costs and the programmatic unfunded mandates, and you're talking about the gap that we're facing right now. So then what you've heard from us over the last six years um, is the fact that 
oftentimes people forget about this as time moves on. Over the last six years, we have had to cut over 150 positions in this district in order to meet the cutbacks in funding that we've received based on the services required by law and regulation that we have to provide. So it's not like um, we have not been uh, responding. Uh, there's that argument, too, out there, well, you guys were lucky. You, you got $20 million from the race to the top. Well, let's talk about race to the top. That $20 million is only 2% of our budget. And it's 2% over four years. So it's, it's basically $5 million or one-half of a percent over each year. And because we were restructuring our programs, we would have implemented those programs anyway the grant gave us the ability to accelerate those programs. So um, the race to the top isn't um, what helped us, for a better term, get through much of, of that pain. We still had to lay off, as we said, 150, over 150 positions over that period of time. The other thing that people need to understand is that we made a concerted effort and had a philosophic approach to our budget that we would stay away from as much as we could from direct instruction, meaning direct instruction to our kids, which is why they come to school. They, they have to have uh, those individuals making sure that they meet all of the um, goals and objectives that we're required to provide them over that period of time. And we've done that. The problem is everything that sits around these kids, those services, much of that has been eliminated. And it's been eliminated because the concept of foundation aid, which provides for a funding formula that, for a better term, gives more to school districts that high, have high need students um, as a percentage of total uh, state aid, that has not been put into real term effect. We talked about that over and over and over again. We filed a complaint with the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, which recently we double checked back to them who said it's still alive. So it's, it's been an interesting um, situation. Folks know that I wrote um, in my view, a couple of weeks ago about this whole situation around foundation aid, the long and short of it is, if you're going to talk a good game, you better back it up. And unfortunately, we're not backing it up in this state. And we're a perfect example of that. We've been able to protect direct instruction and the things around direct instruction <coughs> and the legally required um, positions. But the services that our kids need um, have been drastically um, reduced as a result of the situation of not properly funding this type of school district and the needs of our students. So uh, although we, we have a budget that sits in front of us, we see a gap. The gap is clearly identified pretty much by two major issues. The one issue, as I said, we've started to mitigate about a month and a half ago, and that is um, that $3.6 million estimated uh, cost to us of um, um, policy increase costs for health insurance. And we're hoping that we should be able to mitigate that pretty, uh, pretty well. But then the second piece, uh, where we still need, for a better term, some noise around is to make sure that um, if you're going to ask us to do more and you're going to ask us to provide services that our kids need versus most other students, then you also have to help us with those mandates. Um, because it's not appropriate um, to keep putting that, for a better term, on the backs of the local uh, community. So um, we're hoping that uh, between the Senate and the Assembly, that they're able to convince um, in that tripartite of who puts the budget together, three individuals, 
that when they come out with a budget in April 1st, that there will be substantial um, recognition of the needs of high needs students and high needs school districts. And as a result of that, that gap will be um, mitigated um, in significant ways as it was last year. And um, hopefully we can protect the staff that we have uh, at this point in time to make sure that our service level to our students is consistent. Thank you, Dr. E. So what I'd like to do before we get to the uh, public input for this is go around the table for any questions in case there are some that might already be answered uh, for the public. So um, if anybody has any questions about tonight's presentation, we'll start off with Mr. Pierre. None? Mrs. Knapp? None? Mr. Bison? Um, just a general question in regards to a newspaper article that was on Sunday with regards to how will that affect us when they're talking about building per student cost? Well, I, I don't know the answer to that because I don't, I don't know. Do you see it happening? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm not really concerned about switching to a, a building per pupil cost because we only have two uh, uh, middle schools, and the cost per pupil is almost identical in those buildings. Okay. And you will also know because of the, the, the work that the community has done in supporting our capital projects, this building alone, putting this building up, um, taking larger amounts of students and putting them in environments that act small. Uh, we have now three of those buildings, right? Mm -hmm. We went through uh, closing Truman Moon was hard because it was a small community school, mm -hmm. but the cost per pupil in that school was $8,000 more per student than in this building, um, almost the same as uh, Maple Hill, and then slightly smaller um, than um, Carter. So simply put, um, we've, been, we've been trying to re manage and reduce our cost per pupil and make them similar yeah, from each building. building to building. So I, I don't really see an issue there for us because um, our elementary schools now are balanced pretty well as a cost per pupil. Okay. Thank you. Pastor Williams? Mr. Crescenza? Mr. Carino? You know, uh, people will say we have high administrative costs in this district, but I'd like to remind people, maybe you can remind the public that uh, we have perhaps the highest number of students per administrator than most of the districts around here. Am I correct on that? And we have excess administrators in uh, recent years. For example, uh, previously we had a director of elementary uh, curriculum, and Mr. Del Moros is, is, uh, has assumed that uh, position also. Um, we had a, a number of, uh, of dedicated individuals in the central administration office, which we do not have now. Uh, do you want to comment on that, Dr. Eastwood? Well, I, I think that's um, that all drives drives the the, the statement about um, folks folks that say to us that um, our salaries are high, or you know, or program costs are high. Um, the fact of the matter is our per pupil cost in this district is below the state average. It's almost a thousand dollars less than similar districts. So um, if, if you think about everything that we've done in the district uh, with capital projects to make sure that our kids go to buildings that um, are safe, clean, modern, um, so they have images of uh, districts in um, districts whose, whose demographics and finances are drastically different uh, than ours. So they can feel the same as anybody else, for a better term. Um, yeah, we've done that purposely so. Mm -hmm. But if you put everything into the perspective um, that I tried to talk about just a few minutes ago, We've done it 
at a cost that's lower than the average per pupil in this state. So if, if our cost per pupil was in the top 10 percent or something to that effect, then there could be a lot of appropriate criticism. But we're doing the things that we're doing. We're offering the programs that we offer. We have the facilities for our kids that uh, we're now offering. And we're still below the average per pupil cost. So, you know, uh, those are facts. And when it comes down to it, are you, is, this, is the community getting a good bang for its buck? That's what I hear all the time. And the answer is yes, because you're getting a per pupil cost that's less than the average. Yeah. And those kids, our kids, are getting facilities and programs that, um, for a better term, when you look at it from kindergarten all the way through uh, the college courses in our um, high school and the programs in our high school, um, you're getting a really good bang for your buck in this community. You know, it, it's not unusual for s states to recognize the uh, that there's a great greater need in some cases in, in districts such as ours uh, where we have a high poverty uh, level. Does it does not Connecticut or Jer and Jersey do this? Well, that's correct, and actually um, a lot of the data in my article it, it was derived by the fact that if you look at surrounding states like Jersey and Connecticut, uh, et cetera, uh, you'll find that the distribution, there's two a aspects of the distribution. Um, one is that uh, the distributions are more um, fair relative to the needs of the students in the school district. The second is that um, there is um, also uh, um, a consistency of those types of districts. There's also a pattern where the majority um, or a greater percentage of the cost per child is coming directly from the state rather from the taxpayer locally. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, the only comments I have, in, and Dr. Eastwood and Mike can correct me if I'm wrong, um, I want the public to be aware that there was, and we were made aware of it via an email from one of our um, community members, um, that there was an uh, article in the record online this afternoon. That article, I finally had an opportunity to, to read it before our meeting today, was a and I'm going to be nice about it. It was a little misleading, and I don't blame the reporter at all, because some of the figures that were included in there were some of our figures from our last meeting that were incorrect. However, one of the figures, which was that 7.39 tax cap, almost made it seem within the story that that was how much the board was going to increase taxes by as part of this budget process. I do not, I want to make sure everyone in the public is aware that that was never the case. That was just presenting to the public what the tax, the allowable tax cap would have been based on the calculations that were presented at our last school board meeting. And as we just noted, that's now been corrected and that tax cap figure is 3.9. That doesn't mean that the board's gonna say, let's raise taxes 3.9. It could be, depending on deliberations, um, but it also could be much lower. The 3.9 is just a threshold on when mm -hmm. we would have to go to a 60 plus one supermajority vote if we wanted to increase it beyond that number. Am I correct so far? Mm -hmm. So anything below that number would only require the, the basic 50% plus one. So when you read that article, if that does not get changed, those facts and figures within that article, and it comes out tomorrow, and you have questions, Please contact Mr. Tuttle. He'll be more than happy to discuss what the actual figures are and what they mean. The school board has not yet had any discussion um, within itself or public or any otherwise um, in regards to what it would consider a fair amount for taxes for this upcoming school budget season. We haven't 
we're just going through the process right now. Those deliberations will happen over our next school board meeting. I'm there's a lot of activity that happens before that, too, because even though we pass our budget with what we estimate that to be, it then has to go through the assessments and uh, those deliberations, and then finally the uh, tax bills are sent out. So there, there's a lot of work from, from today into the fall where that is. Um, I, I also think that it's important because we did have uh, one individual um, email us, um, and that is something that the board may want to have a conversation about, which is um, a lot of our, our um, constituents, uh, because of the, their financial situations, et cetera, uh, currently we have, I believe, a two-pay system. With penalty. With penalty. Mm -hmm. Uh, the question is whether uh, the board would recognize uh, the ability for them to uh, pay in threes or um, or twos without or, penalty. Or two without penalty. Here's, here's so. and, and I was going to bring that up as part of my second question, and that can be a discussion for our next school board meeting. You just, we, we need to remember that nothing ever comes for free, mm -hmm. okay? The reason why we currently have an installment plan with penalty is because school districts don't get paid up front by their taxes and state aid and then have expenses throughout the year. They have expenses first and then state aid comes in in drips and drabs and the taxes come in in drips and drabs because we get our tax bills in September and some of us pay them in later on after that. But remember, the school district year starts July 1st, so there are expenses that are getting paid. So what you try to avoid is you have a cash flow issue. I'm paying money up front. I haven't gotten paid for that yet. So some school districts, and we've been fortunate enough to have a very good financially sound administrative staff, plan for that cash flow shortfall until we start getting reimbursed with state aid and with taxes. If that cash flow starts to go away, then like happens at other school districts, they borrow money through bond anticipate, revenue anticipation notes, mm -hmm. and they pay interest on that. So if our cash flow begins to dwindle because more and more people are going to use an installment plan, and then we're not collecting a penalty, that cash flow is going to get tighter and tighter, and you open up the possibility that down the road you would then need to borrow until you get your revenue in. And so that's the balancing act that you have to play. And I'm just trying to, you know, I, listen, I think every taxpayer would like to have the flexibility to, to pay an installment without a penalty. Um, but there are repercussions. It could actually cost the taxpayer more um, afterwards, and we just need to be aware of that when we have that discussion. Am I wrong in that assessment? No, you're correct. And that would be when you adopt the um, tax rates, when you, however you want to set up your payment calculation. So we'll definitely discuss it because it was a concern that was brought to us via email by one of our constituents. But I just I want to let folks know that it has to be a very um, in-depth conversation um, because we don't want to end up costing the taxpayer more money on the back end because we're trying to make things um, a little bit more flexible on the front end. Mr. Estrada, I know in the past I asked Betsy how many people really took advantage. And I, and I don't think, and maybe you can um, fill us in on that, I don't think it was a lot of folks. You know, if you look at our taxpaying basis and then see how many actually, because you have to pay the first half, I think it's by the end of October, yeah. and then I think you have until the end of March, and it goes like 1%, yeah. 2%. I will say, though, that it probably affects um, our um, older residences more than our younger, mm -hmm. because typically a lot of our older bank. residences have already paid off their mortgages over the years, and so they don't have a bank that's collecting escrow, escrow. Mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. their payment. So they get their tax bill and they pay it, mm -hmm. versus somebody who's had that monthly escrow set aside by the bank. When you're on escrow with a bank, the tax bill gets paid in full. It does right not away. get paid mm -hmm. in installments. Yeah. Because they the bank's collected that money ahead of time mm -hmm. for you. I don't I don't know the exact number, but I'll get it for you tomorrow. Yeah, I thought it was kind of minute for and I thought more people would buy into it and 
you know, take advantage of it. Uh, Mr. Perino and then Mrs. Knapp. I was always on the impression, in fact, I asked the, the question about penalties uh, a, a couple of years ago, and I was told that state law, you have to charge a penalty. So maybe that should be clarified. Okay. I remember asking Mrs. McKee in this. Yeah. So. I'm sure that's the case. Um, that's a good question. And we'll, we'll get that to you. We, we ha I have worked with our attorney because the question came up, I think, in October about the payment. So we'll get clarity on all your answers. And, um, you know, we have some time to talk about it because we don't need to do anything until we adopt the tax rates for next year. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Knapp. I was just going to um, reiterate, I just remember paying my city of Middletown taxes. And I do believe that's twice a year, but I do believe that it's just there is a penalty. Not no. on the city taxes, yeah. Not with the city taxes. But they're set that way, I believe. I don't think it's a planned lump sum. In, the, in other words, they have two taxing bills yes, that happen true. twice yeah, a year. Right. It's not one bill that's due one no, day and you're then right. you're allowed to split it up. January so that's the difference between not having a penalty and not. They just have two separate tax payment dates. Mm -hmm. We, we will have to review a lot of things. I think there's other expenses associated with multiple payments with the banks, and so we'll, we'll review all that information. Now, and, and maybe if what Mr. Perino says is correct, maybe the way to go about it, if we want to do it, is to, to, ha to have two separate tax statements similar to what the, But then again, that opens up what I had mentioned right. before. So we'll have that discussion down the road. If that's legal. Does anybody have any other questions before we move on to the public input? No. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Tuttle. At this time, if anybody from the public would like to come up and give us some input, tell us what you think about uh, what you've heard so far regarding the budget, both the tax cap and our discussions, and we'll definitely take that in as we continue to deliberate. Anybody? Oh. Why not, Mr. Warren? How are you? Good, how are you? Good evening, Mr. Estrada, Mr. Perino, members of the board, Dr. Eastwood, um, Mr. Del Moro, Mr. Tuttle, Mrs. Clark, members of the public. Um, I just wanted to, uh, well, I noticed that we're two weeks out from the um, what has been the past few years um, a, a pretty rigidly adhered to state budget um, adoption. It used to be that it wasn't always um, April 1st, but the past couple years they've been pretty good about um, getting it done on time. So that means all of us have two weeks to contact our elected representatives. So for most of us, that's Senator John Bonasick and Assemblywoman Aileen Gunther. For some of us, you might have um, James Scoofus as your uh, Assembly um, representative. And traditionally, um, Mrs. Gunther and Mr. Scoofus have been pretty good about um, doing what they can for us. Um, Mr. Scoofus is, has only a very small portion of our district as um, it, that he represents. So he's going to have a limited effect, but he's very pro-education. But I would, regardless of whether Mrs. Gunther has been good to us or not in the past, it's worth a phone call. So you can look the two of them up. Um, Aileen Gunther, um, I don't have her phone number, um, or John Bonasick. Both of them have local offices, and both of them have offices in Albany. I would recommend that it's, for all of you, that it's worth the, the phone call. And it does have an impact on them. Um, I mentioned that traditionally the two of them have been pretty good, um, whereas the, our senator has not always been so great for 
uh, pushing for education as his one of his priorities. Um, he'd like to think that he is, but uh, he seems to be, uh, this seems to be something that he ignores. So I would recommend that that would be more of an important call um, to try to pressure our elected representatives to do what they can um, to improve the, um, uh, to improve our specific budget situation and um, to to really uh, come to the aid of education, um, you know, completely. For a number of years, we've been lacking in um, foundation aid. We're still, but what are we owed foundation aid wise? Million? 48? 48. 48 million, okay. Um, that's not a small pittance. And if the state came through with that money, we would be more than, or we, we wouldn't be having these kind of discussions year after year after year. Now they came through with gap um, money last year, but still are hedging on the foundation aid. And I think it's really worth us to pressure them once again. Um, we've done it and year after year, but we shouldn't have to do that year after year. So uh, for, for everybody out there, it's worth the phone call. Please um, just, you know, pick up the phone and pressure our representatives. Thanks. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your service as well. And thank you for, you know, it. it even though it doesn't look great, um, I have uh, faith that it, it'll look a little bit better in in a few weeks. I, I'm. At and least you've I'm, been in this seat I'm when it's hoping, been worse. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a lot worse. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Warren. I Thank do you. want to let uh, folks know as a follow-up to what Mr. Warren addressed. On Tuesday, um, the superintendent, myself, and Mr. Crescenzo were set to go to Albany for a small city school district conference. And following that, we had scheduled appointments with Assemblywoman Gunther, Assemblyman Skoufis, and Senator Bonasek. They were all going to be listening to us on Tuesday, and they were very open about uh, wanting to speak to us. But unfortunately, we got hit with the snowstorm and all of that got canceled. So we have been reaching out to them. They've been open to hearing from us, um, and we want to make sure we keep the dialogue open. Um, anything that the public can do to contact them will always push the needle, as we found out last year. Last year we faced a similar size budget shortfall, and we came through with some additional foundation aid at the end that kind of circumvented that, but thank you. Um, would anybody else like to address the board at this time? Seeing none, that concludes our community budget input for this evening. We'll move on to action items and approval. I need a motion for the approval of financial memorandum number 20. Second. Moved by Mrs. Knapp, seconded by Ms. Tobiason. Can I? Go ahead. Um, just so the public knows, um, small city schools oftentimes operate differently than uh, central schools, other types of schools. So. You'll see that tonight we had a public meeting uh, for comment on our budget. Uh, although in one or two more sessions, I think it's two more sessions, you'll see that the official um, deadline or the official meeting for public. Pub the public uh, occurs. It's this Board of Education a number of years ago recognized that irony. Why well, have comment after you've already? approved the budget. Didn't make sense. But under the law, that's the way the law works. So the, the board had this meeting to make sure that um, the public had time before the Board of Education adopts a budget to comment on that. That's what the purpose of this meeting was. So when you see another uh, public meeting, that's to meet the, the, the letter of the law, which is after the board adopts its budget. So I just wanted to make sure I clarify that so people know how that, that operates. This meeting was uh, put together specifically by the board to make sure you had an opportunity before uh, they adopted their budget to have comment on it. And that doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you between now and budget adoption time. There are two more. We have a meeting on April 6th, and then we officially ad adopt our budget on April 20th. So definitely. And listen, if you have any other questions outside of this realm, 
All of our email addresses on the school district are on the website as well. You can contact each individual board member. Um, is there any other discussion regarding financial memorandum number 20? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. I need approval for special services memorandum number 18. So moved. Moved by Mr. Perino, seconded by Mrs. Knapp. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. We have let me find them here. Two nominations to consider for um, Orange Ulster BOCES. Um, they are from Martha Bogart and from Lawrence Berger. Um, I'll read you what we have here. We have Dear Board President, this letter contains important information about the annual BOCES administrative budget vote and cooperative board election. The component board's dinner and budget presentation will be held on Wednesday, April 5th, 2017 in the multi-purpose room at the Career and Technical Center in Goshen. The annual BOCES administrative budget vote and cooperative board election will be held on Thursday, April 20th. The, two, the terms of two members of Orange Ulster Cooperative Board expire on June 30th, 2017. If you know someone who might be interested in serving on their board, please provide them with the following nomination form, which we have. If you have any further questions, please contact their superintendent's office. The board members whose terms are expiring are Lawrence E. Berger from the Cornwall Central School District and Martha Bogart from the Goshen Central School District. Both of them will be running for re-election. The length of each term is three years. Um, they must reside, a person who's interested in running must reside within the boundaries of one of the component school districts. A candidate may be but need not be a member of a component school district's board of education, but they must be eligible to hold such office. No employee of a component district is eligible for board membership, and a BOCES board member may not accept employment in a component school district. Um, we have two letters for nominations. One, I believe, is from Larry Berger, fellow Board of Education members. My name is Larry Berger, and I'm asking for your support in being reelected to the position of board member on the Orange Ulster Board of Cooperative Educational Services. I've served on the Orange Ulster Co-op Board for the past three years and the Cornwall School Board for the past 11 years. For the past three years, I've also been the BOCES representative to the Marlborough and Highland Falls Board of Education. I believe that my experience on the Cornwall Board has enabled me to be a better BOCES Board member. During my tenure on the BOCES Board, I've supported the Board's commitment to transparency and expansion of services to meet the needs of a component school districts. As you know, to be chosen to serve on the BOCES Board, I need a nomination by individual school boards. The date by which is due is March 21st, with the voting taking place on April 20th. I hope I can count on your support, and please feel free to contact me with any questions. Our second nomination letter is from Mar Martha Bogart. Um, as I am nearing the completion of my third term on the Orange Ulster BOCES, I am asking for your support in seeking re-election to this board. I'm currently Vice President of the Goshen School Board and during my 33 years of service have also held the Office of President. Currently, I am Goshen's State Legislative Network Delegate. In this position, I represent Goshen as part of the Orange County Delegation of Advocacy in Albany. I also keep my board informed on new state policies. I continue to be active in the Orange County School Board Association and have held the offices of both President and Vice President. Most recently, I served as past President on the Executive Committee. I continue to be a strong advocate for children. BOCES's ever-expanding menu of services offer the component districts vital programs to assist in the education of children with special needs, as well as those who seek career and technical training. These learning opportunities are essential to student achievement and will prepare them to become college and career ready. As part of the cooperative board, I will continue to use my experience to advocate for these important programs while keeping in mind economic challenges. For example, I will strongly support providing more services locally, which will result in cost savings and reduced student travel time. Visiting your me meetings as a BOZES liaison has made it possible for me to learn more about your district goals and how we at BOCES can support them through future programmatic offerings. I hope you will support me as I ask that you place my name in nomination by March 21st, 2017 for your vote on April 20th. I'm available by phone or email 
and would be happy to attend one of your upcoming meetings to address your board directly. Thank you for your consideration, Martha Bogart. So we can choose to nominate one, both, or none. So what I need is a motion for the nomination of Martha Bogart. So moved. Moved by Mr. Perino, seconded by Mrs. Knapp. Um, we'll go around. Uh, what we'll do is let's any discussion on Mrs. Bogart that anybody wants to put out there. No. All those in favor of the nomination of Martha Bogart, say aye. 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 Any opposed? We've nominated Martha Bogart seven zero, and now I need a. A uh, motion for the nomination of Lawrence Berger from Cornwall. So moved. Moved by Mr. Perino. I need a seconded by Mrs. Knapp. Any discussion on Mr. Berger? I was a little confused in his letter mm -hmm. where he says he's on the Cornwall, but he's representing. He can do both. No, but why would he, wouldn't a, a board member on both he's represent? All of those component districts? He, what, he does, what, but he's an, also a school board member for the actual Cornwall School District. Right, but then he said something about Marlboro. He's a liaison. He's a li Remember, Martha, Martha Bogart is our liaison. We've I seen guess. her at meetings here before. He does the same thing for those Thank two Thank you. I was yep. confused. Each of them have been assigned. Okay. Um, Thank you for the clarification. You're welcome. And Mr. Berger came on. I think he replaced a couple of board members when there were some issues that we had. Any further discussion on Mr. Berger? All those in favor of his nomination? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? They all, both carry 7-0. If you can notify that we put their names in for nomination, Mrs. Clark. Uh, next up, we have an approval. I need a resolution to a motion to approve a bid award for our 2014 capital project phase two. Um, I need a motion first. So moved. Mrs. Knapp, seconded by Ms. Tobiason. Um, before we get into any discussion, Mr. Scott, can you please um, give the public a little explanation of what phase two entails? Uh, good evening. Um, the phase two work is Predominantly, if you remember back uh, in our uh, capital project uh, referendum 2014, uh, a large portion of the work was at Middletown High School. Um, we also have done uh, heating and cooling work at uh, Twin Towers in Manhattan. So that's what we consider phase one in the high school. The rest of the work um, is all grouped in phase two, and it's work such as interior finishes at Maple Hill and Manhattan, flooring uh, throughout the uh, corridors, the uh, library uh, carpeting. Uh, additionally, it will be repaving of um, Manhattan Middle School and Twin Towers. Additionally, we'll be building uh, bathrooms on the back of the food service building to serve the food service and the uh, softball field. Um, and we'll be doing um, additional heating work uh, at uh, William Carter. So that's the second group, and I, I think that vote was in two propositions. So it's the larger portion of that second proposition. D does all that work happen simultaneously, or is there going to do one first? Well, it's going to be all simultaneously with, um, you know, the goal of having everything done by September 1. It's a tremendous amount of work. Um, the only thing that's not critical for opening of school is some uh, minor work at the uh, board office and um, at the mechanic shop. And then we also want to remind everybody once again that during the summer, none of our buildings will be accessible to the public, right, for activities? For activities. We, um, summer school for the high school, correct me, I'm rich, uh, high school will be in the high school correct. because we are far enough ahead in our phase one um, renovations of the high school uh, to accommodate that. So. And summer school at the other buildings? The middle school will be at the high school, too, and the elementary and special ed programs will be, be here at, 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 pre at, pre at the presidential. And then um, I know because there were questions about um, the sports camps and stuff, those cannot be held on our property this summer, correct? Yeah, this, this year we will not be able to come. Too much ground. Because there's a lot being done. So 
Um, and I think this, we've already been in contact with the city about that, right? Over yes, we have. Ago. Over a year ago. Okay. <clears throat> Any other discussion for Mr. Scott about phase two and this resolution? No. Just one. Go ahead. Just one comment in general. Uh, you know, since I've been on this board, I have to com compliment the administration and uh, the supervisor of buildings and grounds. Uh, we take great pride in these buildings. If you look around this building, it's kept in excellent condition. And we also we often have we always have plans for preventative maintenance or the administration brings us capital projects which either uh, seek to expand buildings as the need arises or improve uh, the, the various buildings as necessary. So, you know, that, that's something perhaps people don't realize, that uh, we have a very active administration and buildings and grounds supervisor who really keeps up on what's needed in the various buildings. I think, too, uh, Tom, um, before you leave, if you can give us uh, an update on the new capital projects, uh, especially like the water quality, those types of things, too. Right. Those uh, projects were, or the capital projects were approved in December. We are working with our uh, engineer and architectural firms, and that would be the uh, replacement of all the water fountains um, district-wide with uh, water coolers. Um, and that'll give us uh, filtered water. It'll be a water fountain and a bottle fill station um, at every location throughout the district. Um, the sec another part of that is uh, the William A. Carter, um, both land purchase and a uh, access roads, which will come out through uh, the uh, fairgrounds property. Uh, those are uh, currently being worked on. We're taking some geotechnical tests right now. Um, and then the third piece is uh, some place structure addition uh, at the Maple Hill School. And uh, we expect to have those site uh, designers here this coming week. Although with the snow, they're not going to be able to get as much information as they expected. But we'll, we're also kicking that project off. Now, the, I know we've had some issues with, I, I think, drainage or something with the ball field over here. Is that going to be in use in this upcoming year? Or are we? Yes, it will be. Um, we had some issues where we had to actually correct the height of the pitcher's mound uh, compared to home plate, and um, we believe we've got that rectified. So uh, that'll be uh, available for use. And um, I believe some of the ball teams were scheduled to have scrimmages as early as late next week, and I don't see this snow coming off over the next week. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I think we're going to have snow till April on the ground. Well, even after you do, you've got at least a, a good week uh, to dry out the, the uh, playing fields so we don't damage them. So that's so. really putting, I think every school district mm -hmm. is going to have an issue for right. the and opening of the season. Well. And track and field. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Mr. Scott. You're welcome. So all those in favor for approval of the bid award? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. And I need approval for the following, res uh, motion for the following resolution. Be it resolved that the a large city school district of Middletown authorizes the Bond, Schenick, and King law firm to file an Article 78 proceeding on behalf of the enlarged city school district of Middletown against the Orange Ulster Health Plan for failure to release requested FOIL documents. I need a motion. So move. Move. Boy, everybody wanted to give that motion. Moved by Mr. Perino, seconded by Ms. Tobiason. Any discussion? This was discussed in executive session by the board. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Moving on to committee reports real quick. Uh, audit, Ms. Tobiason. Our next meeting is Thursday, April 27th. Tentatively scheduled for 6. If we can move it to 4.30, we will. Thank you. Buildings and, and the public is invited. What? Uh, what? Buildings and grounds, Mr. Perino. Well, uh, we were going to have a meeting at the buildings and grounds and security meeting, but uh, the snow kind of put the kibosh. that off. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, to be determined. To be determined on that one. All right. 
Um, we'll bypass anything. We haven't done anything on change orders recently, right? No. Uh, diversity committee, Pastor Williams, anything? Uh, fair funding, we have not heard. I have not heard anything yet from Warwick, so you're off the hook for right now, Mr. IEP reviews, Mr. Perino. Mrs. Clark is a regular telephone caller, <laughs> pen pal, phone pal. Uh, Mrs. Blumenau is stuck in Florida, if you can say the word stuck in uh, Florida in the same sentence. Um, so we'll bypass town of Walk Hill. Uh, Pastor Williams, anything on Middletown? Um, Orange County School Boards, they do not have a meeting in April, um, so we'll see them back in, in uh, March or May, so we don't have anything to report at this time. Neither do we have on NISBA. Um, policy Committee, uh, Dr. Eastwood continues to work on policy. Um, if we can get that stuff April 1st, I think we wanted to try to get it ready for, if possible. There, be, there's, there's still going to be maybe one or two that we're having problems with. Um, because it's uh, two of those policies, especially the one that deals with um, the website um, and those types of uh, collateral or related issues um, have become somewhat problematic, so. Okay. But otherwise, we're Thank you. And then that'll, I think that'll leave us with two remaining sections, right, Mrs. Clark, after that? We wanna try to get them done before the school year. That's my swan song to leave behind. No policies to be looked at. Um, and you don't get done, I just have to No, that ain't happening. Um, safety and security, Mr. Perino, you just mentioned, right, you're yep. going to uh, do that later. And that takes care of our committee reports. Anything new and compelling for roundtable, Pastor Williams? No. Mr. Cusenzo? Mr. Tobiasen? Mr. Perino? We're good. We're good. Our next meeting this is a reminder, we'll be on Thursday, April 6th. We will be having the meeting at the high school, um, and we are going to schedule a board tour of the project that we'd like to begin at 4.30, 4 o'clock. Well, the sooner the better, because once you get, once you get into there, you're going to be asking a lot of questions, I'm sure, and... Um, remember, we have to go from the third floor, and then we have to go down for so, the term down to the so. Tentatively, we'll yeah. schedule for the board to get there at four o'clock. Those who can join us right then can join us. If those have to come in later from work, then they can join us midstream, um, and then we'll have um, we'll have our pre-agenda to discuss what time pre-executive uh, session is. And then the board meeting will follow at 6.30 as scheduled at the high school. And that will be on Thursday, April 6th. You're going to be amazed because they're already sheetrocking down in the courtyard area. Mm -hmm. so. so, folks, thank you very much for joining us this evening. This concludes our meeting, and we'll see you back on April 6th. Please have a safe next two weeks. I need a motion to adjourn, or otherwise we're here forever. Moved by Ms. Tobias and seconded by Mr. Perino. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Five zero. Have a nice evening, folks.